flies to Jesus like a dove. He, a heavenly voice says, you are my beloved son. Hello, this is Michael Beverly. Welcome to my channel. This is Saturday Scripture Scrutiny, where we dive into textual issues, challenges, contradictions, and errors. In All of these supposed contradictions or alleged errors, if you will, in the Bible. Christian apologists can always explain away any apparent contradiction or error. But when they add up to the hundreds, it's a lot harder. Hey, everybody, it's Michael Beverly here. Welcome to another scripture scrutiny where I go through scenes, not necessarily one verse at a time, but like little chunks or scenes. As I keep saying, and I'll say again, I'm not a biblical scholar. What I do is go out and study some stuff and look at some stuff. And then I present with you and your job is to go study this yourself if it interests you, especially if you're Christian. And if you're wondering about my shirt, if you're in Austin, it's a, a, a Jewish Mexican fusion. Um, anyways, super good. My, my daughter's in law school at Texas Law because she's freaking smart. So I've been to Austin a couple times. Um, anyways, Mark 1. Let's get down to this. Verse 12. And at once the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals and angels attended him. Now, a couple things. You know, if you go back to the earliest manuscripts in the Greek and stuff, sometimes some of these words. So the, in the NIV, they say tempted is sometimes uh, presented or interpreted or, you know, translated as tested. Um, probably because there's some probably some theological difference on the difference. What, you know, can could could Jesus really be tempted now? The orthodox position, of course, is Jesus could be tempted because he was fully man. Because if he couldn't be tempted, what was the point, right? So, I mean, that's that's why his sinlessness matters, because he was fully human and he, and he could have sinned, but he didn't. Okay, and then um, once the spirit is pneuma, so the Holy Spirit. Now, this is going to get fleshed out later more. So I have, I have a couple clips here. I have a clip from uh, Robin... Faith, Robin Faith Walsh, PhD. She's somebody that appears on Myth Vision. I got one of her courses. I have a clip from that course. It's just a short amount, like it's a paid course. So this is going to be a short, like fair use clip. And I do recommend checking out her material. And I bought this course through uh, Derek's, Derek Lambert's Myth Vision. So it's a plug for him. If you're interested in uh, this course or any others, check out. My, I think pretty much all of Derek's videos have links to various courses. I'm a little teeny channel, so I don't have any of that stuff. I don't have any affiliate links. I'm not making any money at this point. Maybe at some day I'll be bigger. And if you guys like and subscribe and support and share, hopefully I can get bigger, I can get monetized, and then I can get some of these scholars on my show. But for now, I'm studying some other stuff. And, and you know, like what I'm presenting to you is things to help you think. I'm not saying I'm an expert. I'm just saying... I've gone out and looked at some stuff, and I have. It, but here's some things that bother me. And if you're a Christian apologist, I am the kind of guy that that's going to ask you questions or want to know what you think or how you get around some of these problems. So the big problem here in in Mark that that I see right off the bat is it's the same problem I saw with the baptism, where you have to believe that Mark either as an eyewitness or talking to an eyewitness, which, of course, skeptics don't think that. They think Mark was written way, way later. But if you're, you know, an ear rent, an ear, if you're believing the ear, sorry, ear, inerrant scriptures, like if you think that Mark was like literally writing stuff down because he it, witnessed it himself or he was interviewing witnesses, then you got to explain why he, why he left out half of God's speech because Matthew and Luke have God saying different things. So the standard apologist answer is, oh, well, Mark just thought these things were important and Matthew and Luke thought these other things are important, which that excuse might fly if it's just a normal, ordinary conversation or just a regular old teaching. But that was the, the God speaking from heaven, like, like the Father God saying today, 
you know, well, he didn't say it. He, he said that the today part is referenced in Acts. So just to be accurate here, in Mark, it's like, um, you are my son. He talks, you, you are my son. And in Matthew and Luke, it's that this is my son. So if you don't believe that's an error or a change, you have to believe God said both things. And Mark just didn't think it was important to write down half of what God said. Now, the same problem applies to this. So when we look at the when we look at Matthew and we look at Luke, the story is bigger. It has more stuff. Now, apologists will say, oh, well, you know, Mark was just giving us the bare bones, just the basic, you know, this this basic one one sentence, really. Jesus gets the spirit. The spirit leads him out to the wilderness for 40 days and he's tempted or he's tested by Satan. And there are some wild animals and some angels that attend it. That, and, that, and that's it. Now, interesting to me, when I was a Christian, and, and I didn't realize I was doing this until I started reading Bart Urban. When I was a Christian, I would read or study or meditate on sections of scriptures like, okay, Right now I'm reading Ephesians, blah, blah, blah. And if, we, if I was going through a Bible study or a, a lecture s series or a Sunday, like sometimes the pastor would, would say, okay, we're going to study this stuff. You would do those in sections. But I never went through what Bart Ehrman suggests until I was actually an atheist when I did this, is I looked at each, like each scene all at once and studied the scene. So that's what I'm asking you to do. Read it in your own Bible or go to BibleGateway.com or whatever and and ask yourself why, what logical reason would there be for Mark, who is presumably presenting this to us, to, you know, the gospel is supposed to be good news, like to explain about Jesus and so forth. What possible reason could he have for leaving out all the speeches between Jesus and Satan. Now, you might say, well, you know, maybe quoting Satan isn't so important, but he's Satan is talking to Jesus. So if you believe Jesus is God, you believe Jesus' words are important, why in the world would Mark not write down what Jesus said? Now, the other problem, of course, is how did anybody know what happened in the desert when Jesus was alone with Satan or with the angels? So you have to believe that Jesus went back and told Mark, you know, I was with at least the basic details. I was in the desert 40, 40 days. Now, here's another issue. I'm just not going to belabor this point, but the whole number 40 is symbolic. Like 40, Moses, Moses went through the wilderness or, you know, wandered and didn't get to the promised land and spent 40 years in, you know, wandering in the desert. This kind of stuff happens all the time. And you got to ask yourself, is that really what happened? Really? Like all these coincidences, coincidence, coincidence, coincidences start adding up. Um, so why is it that Mark, if it's so, if like if Mark's recording this, he doesn't think it's important to write down Jesus, who, who Jesus is God, and Jesus is like even if even if he writes all of Mark, and by the end Jesus is, you know, he's risen. So Mark ought to know that this is important, and all the stuff that that Jesus said you you would think would be important. No. Okay, let's let's hear what some other people have to say. I'm going to give you one example of what I mean when I say that Matthew and Luke are using Mark. So I'll provide this for you um, to take a look at, but go take a look at some point at Mark 1, 12 through 13, and then look at Matthew 4, 1 through 11, and Luke 4, 1 through 13. Okay, so once again, this is this is from a paid course. I hope this is fair use. I just I'm just going to use it just like two minutes out of several hours of lectures. And again, I'm I'm pitching it. Go over to um, MythVision, and Derek has links in his thing if you're interested in taking the course. She, uh, so far, I'm enjoying it. She's a good teacher. And um, what's interesting is I started this actually this last week, and I realized, hey, I'm talking on this very thing she's mentioning. And that is Mark has this one sentence, and then Matthew and Luke build on it. So what she has to say 
you know, serendipitously matched this week's thing that I was talking about. So here we go. And um, here's the here's the course. And again, if, if you're interested, go check it out. You're going to notice that there are a lot of different choices that Mark, Matthew, and Luke make around the lines of what I've been talking about. You then go look. I mean, you can just tell from what I said. That was one line in Mark. It takes Matthew four lines to tell the same story. And in it, he does a lot of, he makes a lot of references um, to the Hebrew scriptures. And he always says, it is written. So when you go look at this passage, you'll see he takes that core story, but he adds, adds, it is written, one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God, right? So there's a detail that Mark doesn't have, but you'll see otherwise it's the same story. Okay, don't forget now that it's not like Mark and Matthew, Luke and John the, are the writers of these gospels. We're sitting around in a room and discussing, you know, like who, who was going to include what part. Matthew and Luke copy much of Mark, often just copy and paste. Most scholars agree that Mark was written around the, the early 70s and that Matthew came next, as the earliest, maybe 80, 85, somewhere in there. And then Luke comes sometime later and then John circa 90 to maybe as late as 120. Like th these things didn't happen all at once. So you can't say that Mark left all this stuff out because he knew Matthew and Luke were going to include it because that's ridiculous. The Bible, as Christians know it, didn't exist then. So it wasn't like it. Sorry, that was silly dog. It wasn't as if it wasn't as if there's some there's some grand meeting or organizer that tells Mark oh, don't worry about leaving out this whole Jesus quoting scripture. Because, you know, that should, you would think that would be pretty important, no? Same with Luke and 4, 1 through 13. Now we have even more lines. Remember, Luke likes to add even more detail. He talks about Jesus being full of the Holy Pneuma, the Holy Spirit. Um, he talks about the Jordan. He talks about being tempted by the devil. He's much more dramatic. And then he says, and he ate nothing at all in those days. And when they were over, he was famished. And the devil said to him, there's a whole detail about Jesus's struggle, about his conversation with the devil. None of that happens, as you saw in Mark. So Okay, so none of that stuff happens in Mark that comes later. So what's up with that? That to me is a big problem. So one of the one of the things that the Christians just they just don't want to agree happened is that is that Luke and Matthew are embellishing and adding for reasons such as theology or to get a point across or to to, or to counteract something like in the baptism in the baptism scene, they they want to counteract the idea that Jesus was adopted by God at his baptism. So they add stuff. They add different words from God, and they add you know, and they both add nativities. Now another thing I, I don't think I've mentioned this yet, but this whole Jesus gets tempted in the the fasting and the what happens in Matthew and Luke with uh, being taken to the highest mountain and being tempted with turning stones to bread doesn't happen in John. So uh, again, why, why would John leave that stuff out? Now John's written way later and you could argue, I suppose that, well, well, John knew Matthew and Luke had that covered, but it's still, that seems like a weak excuse. It just seems weak to me that somebody's writing these stories about Jesus and who he is and why it's important. And they just, they leave stuff out that, you know, God, that God actually said, you, you would think you'd write down everything God said. I mean, that to me would be like the minimum. Like, let's say we're having a meeting about what we should put in these and we're writing a gospel and like, maybe I'm, maybe you're my editor. And I say, Hey, I, I got this, I got this, this stuff God said, should that, should I put that in there? Come on, you, you think the editor's going to say, nah, it's just God. He talks a lot. It, it cut, cut out a few words. It won't, it's not going to change nothing or hurt nothing. So I think that's a big problem when we, when we look at these scriptures that 
that it seems like somebody's sneaking in some fiction and making stories up to sell a point, to sell a theology, or or just to make it more interesting. Okay, so this this next clip is from a super chat when um, Derek, this is just from a few days ago on Myth Vision, had um, Dennis McDonald. And so he's going to mention some stuff about, well, you can read my question. I In the clip, that my question is at the bottom. But it's basically asking him, hey, what's up with the story in Mark? Uh, actually, um, Mark gets that from the Q document. Um, and the Q document has done so in order to um, fit a kind of mythic pattern that you also find, by the way, in uh, the Odyssey. Young Telemachus, Odysseus's son, um, has a visitation by Athena, uh, who flies to him, by the way, reassures him that he's the son of Odysseus, and says, you've got to go and kick butt in your house to get rid of the suitors. And so when he goes to the suitors, um, he's trying to claim back his kingdom. And um, he's going to have to resist them. And in the end, with his father, he's going to kill the suitors and take responsibility of the kingdom. In the Q document, the same thing happens. The Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God flies to Jesus like a dove. He, a heavenly voice says, you are my beloved son. Then uh, the devil offers him the kingdoms of the world and Jesus refuses it because he knows now that he's God's son, he's responsible for God's kingdom. So as soon as he goes to Galilee, what does he say? He says, repent, the kingdom of God is upon you. It, it has arrived. And so G Jesus is um, crowned as the prince in a sense, but he has to show his metal that he's worth it. By the way, this is a part of the hero cycle that's been recognized that um, young men often, um, like Gilgamesh, uh, have to face a dragon or a challenge uh, early in their careers to show them their metal uh, and that they're worthy of being a hero. And then they go and they have their exploits and careers. So uh, this, and by the way, the Buddha has a similar experience um, before he goes out and uh, cares for the poor and, uh, and pre preaches enlightenment. Uh, now, of course, some of the stuff that he's talking about is not in Mark, it's in Matthew and Luke. But what the theory is, and, you know, again, I'm not a Bible scholar and I'm not a scholar of Greek stuff. I was inspired to buy the Odyssey, and I'm reading it, and also the Iliad by a different translator. Um, I actually asked in a different super chat, hey, what do you think of these two translators? And he said, you know, he said they were both good and he gave me some differences in how I, and I actually bought two different translation translators on purpose. Just was curious, like if there was any difference in how they read. So I'm super fascinated with this, with this theory. Now, since we're talking about Mark, it doesn't quite apply as much. Although the theory kind of is, look, Luke and Matthew see what Mark did and, and they're, they're triggered by certain things that happen that signal this is what it means okay so for instance the in the in mark's empty tomb what it meant was like the translation of a of a human into like a god or a demigod like the, the king is taken up or so forth the, so these were well known to the readers of uh, of myths, fables, as as well as fictional works. So it was a trigger. And so that, you know, I'm not, I mean, we're not getting the exact theory, right? But the way I understand it is that when Matthew and Luke look at these stories, they know, they know the archetype, they know the genre, they are, they, you know, they know what's supposed to happen. Um, so they flesh it out some more. And before you just dismiss that as a wild, you know, I, I would like to point out that um, Dennis McDonald went to the Bob Jones, I believe, and is, you know, he's he's not a he's an atheist. He's but he was a former Christian, 
And so, like, it's not like he's some hostile skeptic that grew up, you know, we, we, it's not like he was raised by Richard Dawkins and he hates Christians and he hates the Bible. No, he actually loves the Bible and he, he likes Christians. He, he doesn't like, as, and I'm, I'm saying stuff that he said himself in, in this, in that, um, in the talk I talked to when I was chatting in the chat and he was lecturing and I asked him super chats and there are other people asked some questions and he was kind of talking about the, the lifestyle that he lives, that he, that he's got a lot of friends that are like retired Christian missionaries. And he, so there's not like this hostility towards Christianity or towards, towards the Bible. Like he's not some nutcase. that's just pulling stuff out of the air. And I would challenge you. So one of the things I read, um, and we'll talk about this later when we get to this, to this is, um, I think it's Mark five or Mark six, where Jesus goes in the 3000, um, pigs jump in the water and so forth. So there's lots of reasons that that story exists. And there's lots of places where that story has parallels. And when I read, uh, I read a, I read like a chart that uh, Dennis McDonald made of that, that it gives like line and, and it says, okay, the, in the Bible it has this and Mark has this, and then Homer has this, and then Mark has this and Homer has this. And, and like, it's undeniable. Now you could argue Hey, that's just a massive coincidence that, you know, God didn't notice or God planned. But the more likely story is Mark was a Greek trained writer and he was well familiar with Greek literature, obviously Homer and Virgil and so forth, Euripides, blah, blah, blah. So I think I'm about to wrap this up. I do want to say one thing. I... I have some experience as a novelist. A couple years back, I I did a three book contract as a ghostwriter. It's under it's under a NDR, so I can't say the thing. Um, I had done some indie writing on my own. I'm not a I, I'm basically I'm a failed novelist. I'm not like bragging about how great I am at writing novels. Unfortunately, my business now is in the big in the marketing or promotion. We my clients are like indie writers, so I think I understand the thing. I understand the business is my point. And I didn't get a contract to ghostwrite some books because I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just I'm like, I'm not good enough to be, you know, a professional full full time writer. Um, sadly, that was my dream. That's actually why I came to Mexico because it's so cheap to live here. Although it, lately inflation and the peso dollar rate has made that more difficult. But I, so um Anyways, without going into that story, but my point here is that I studied a lot. Like I have, I have read dozens and dozens and dozens of books on how to write a novel, how to structure things, tropes, conventions, obligatory scenes. So these things in, in, in my, like you pick up a thriller book, you might not know it, but there's a structure to it. That if it's not there, you're probably not going to like it if you like thrillers. If you like mysteries, if you like romance, there's certain things you expect, even if it's subconsciously or even if you can't put a label on it. If you're if you're reading if you're reading a, a murder mystery, obviously there's got to be a murder, right? Well, I mean that's an obvious one, but there's lots of other things that happen that are specific for for the genre, and so. What guys like um, Dennis McDonald and also another one that I really like, I, I hope to get his book and read it. I just haven't, I haven't had the time or the money or energy to do all the stuff that I want to do, um, but that's on my list. So that, and that's Richard uh, C. Miller's work. So the idea is when you, when you see the genre that something's written in and you see like, I hate to use the word parallel because it puts something in somebody's mind, like. I'm not saying they're copy. I'm not saying that, and I don't think anyone else is saying, oh, the writer of Mark or Matthew or Luke got, you know, picked up, picked up the Odyssey and said, oh, on line 170 in this book. Okay. When a God took pity on me wandering all alone. Okay. I'm going to write that down in the Bible. That's not what happened. Uh, that, nobody's saying that's, that's how it works. What they're saying is is things like the hero journey and things like, um, like what Dennis McDonald just said, like there's a, a spirit comes down and there's, there's a, like an ordination and 
you see these you see these commonalities in Dionysus and Jesus parallels to use the word again I know people freak out about that but boy when I read some of this stuff it it I see it and I see it like as a novelist and I again as not a very good novelist but good enough to understand how novels and fiction are written commercially and successfully I do understand that even if I can't actually do it perfectly and one of the ways that readers will want to read your novel or your story is if they if they subconsciously or sometimes they actually consciously know what it is you're doing so when you when you present a scene it doesn't have to be and it actually it shouldn't be an exact copy of the scene from another great writer from literature but it can but it can be an archetype so for instance if if you if you watch west side story you know that it's taken now this is a more direct example it's taken from shakespeare's romeo and juliet and in some cases it's like the scenes are almost identical and, that, and that's a blatant example and like nobody's trying to hide that west side story came from anywhere but romeo and juliet now with the bible stories it's not so obvious they don't come out and make it you know they're not trying to do that it's it's more hidden but the technique reveals itself. And when you read it, there's only two possibilities here. Either it's just a big coincidence or that's the way writers were trained to, trained to write and that's what they did. And that's why you see these these commonalities. So anyways, I I think I'm going, I'm going kind of long here for like two verses. It's like one sentence in Mark, but it just goes to show you how deep these rabbit trails can go when you really get into study this stuff. So again, I challenge you, if you're a Christian, if you're having, whether you're having doubts or whether you're training to be an apologist, where I hope I can be helpful to you is to be like a sounding board because you ought to be able to answer people like me if you're trying to be an apologist. And if you're a Christian who's having some doubts or thoughts, look, I'm not trying to make you into an atheist. I'm not telling you you don't, I'm not telling you not to love Jesus and I'm, I'm not telling you what to think. What I'm telling you is if you want to know the truth about stuff, you got to use critical thinking and you got to use good methodology. And you can't be afraid to ask, what if? You got to be able to ask, what if the Bible's not actually inspired by a God or gods or spirits? What if it's a man made thing? How did it get made? How, what was the process? Can you see the recipe? And if you can, that doesn't prove there's not a God, and I'm not asking you to believe that. I'm just saying maybe that can show you that you don't have to take everything so much like a fundamentalist. Maybe you can relax a little bit. Maybe you can see the, the truth or the ideas that the writers were trying to get across without being stuck on this extreme fundamentalism where everything has to everything has to mesh perfectly to what your theo what you were raised and taught as your theology and anything outside that just has to be wrong no matter what so don't be that way anyways thanks for being with me if you like this please subscribe if you haven't already and share write in the comments um if you think i'm wrong about something and i'm trying to give like i'm trying to give i'm trying to act as a reporter here not as a teacher that's saying I'm an expert and you should listen to what I say. So hopefully it, it will be very hard for me to be wrong because if I'm presenting what what a teacher who is an expert with a PhD believes and I'm and I'm giving different opinions that it, it's like I'm not wrong to give their opinion. That's their opinion. I'm, I'm I I may be wrong in my conclusions, but I hope that you can see I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to ram some thing down anyone's throat. I'm trying to get every, trying to get us to think. That's fair enough, isn't it? All right. Thank you for being here. And if you like these at all, tune in next Saturday. And I'll see you later.